Uh, hi there, this is Ramey over at Money by Ramey. Coming at you today with another new video where we're going to go over the budgeting process that I laid out in my book, Simple Budgeting, um, a minimalist guide to setting up your first budget. Um, if you come over here to moneybyramey.com, um, if you click on this tab, which is Simple Budgeting, the easy eight-step process, uh, eventually this is going to uh, be a book uh, tab with a drop down. Uh, I have a new book coming out on investing, uh, so be on the lookout for that. But today we're basically going to be going over the process that I laid out in here. And if you want, come over here, look at this article. I lay out some reasons why you need to have a budget in your life if you don't already have it, um, as well as the eight step process that I've um, laid out for creating the budget. Now it's a little bit more abbreviated than it is in the book, um, but if you um, go ahead and buy that book, there's a ton of examples in there that should help you uh, get started on your budgeting process. But we're also going to go over um, a little bit of the examples that I use today in a little bit more detail uh, to kind of help you in that process. So first off, if you're new to moneybyremy.com, I just wanted to take a quick minute to let you know what we do here. We uh, teach financial freedom to the universe. Uh, the main goal is to build up our active and passive income sources with the emphasis on passive income. Um, my goal is to make money while I sleep. Um, and as I'm learning to do it more and more, I'm, I'm trying to teach that uh, to others because I believe that being financially free is what it's all about. Um, I do a lot of dividend investing. That's kind of one of my most favorite investing uh, strategies. And that's what I have a book coming out pretty soon. So feel free to visit back, uh, check that out. We have a really cool, awesome dividend learning center here for you, a ton of articles. Um, if you haven't yet, search that archive sec section that gives you every post that I've ever written. And it's just kind of a cool place where you can see a topic that intrigues you and uh, click in on it. And this is a brand new tool. We're actually working on revamping this right now, but this dividend income calculator. Um, if you are interested in investing, it's it's just a really cool thing. So feel free to give it a search. Um, and make sure to give us a follow on our social media channels too. Uh, we're pretty active on all, all these channels. Um, so yeah, if you aren't following us yet, make sure you go out there and do that. Um, so today, yeah, what I wanted to do is go over uh, setting up your first budget, kind of how I did it. And these are examples that came from the book. So all these numbers, I mean, they're not exact to my personal life, but these examples, like the spreadsheets that we're actually using, I went ahead and built these out with um, my personal uh personal financial situation. So um, it's helpful with what I've kind of used in my process. My goal is to keep things simple. So hopefully that's what we'll do here today, uh, but in, in depth enough where you can get started. Um, so the first place I think everybody needs to start is a predicted budget. You need to figure out what do you predict for income? What do you predict for expenses? And therefore, what is your savings rate? Because at the end of the day, it's all about that. If you're spending more than you're actually earning, that's an issue. That means that you're going to be going into negative um, territory pretty quickly. And if you're dealing with credit cards, I mean, then you're getting into, you know, 18, 22, 25 plus percent interest per month, which is not a great situation to be in. So the first thing and probably the easiest thing uh, to do is estimate your income. Um, a lot of people work on salary. Uh, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, this is a little bit more challenging, um, but there's certain things you can do as far as, um, you know, take whatever income you made the last three months and average it out. Um, or just take your best guess number, but uh, with everything, I always recommend being conservative. Um, say th same thing with salary income. If you say, let's say you take home 5000 a month or 6000 a month um, in gross pay, but your actual take-home pay is maybe 3000 4000 put that 3000 or 4000 because that's the extra income that you're going to have left over to service your expenses and achieve a, a different savings rate. Um, so the goal here is to get specific. I mean, you know, I have pretty broad categories right now, but if you... Uh, did create this on your own. And, and if this is helpful, I mean, leave a comment section. Um, leave a comment in the comment section, and I might go ahead and put this on the website. I just don't know if it'd be of benefit to anybody. Um, but what I would do is, like, I have a Capital One checking account, so I'd go Cap One Interest Income. Um, and if I'm doing a side hustle, I'd make sure to define that. Same thing with, you know, Matt's Business income. So I just make sure that I get as, as defined as I possibly can on what I think this is going to be. Out, be. And again, I'd estimate conservatively on what these are going to be. So as you can see right now from this, it's a pretty easy category. It sums up what I think I'm going to get per month. And again, there's other things you can do. I make models where I project this out for a few different months. I did that actually the other day for my personal life. Now I'm running my own business. It kind of takes a little bit more effort. Um, and analysis in order to figure out where I'm going to be at uh, 12 months from now. Uh, but it's something that this is a nice, easy, simple model to get you started. Sums up this, you're making 4000 a month, 48 k per year. So that's what you have to deal with. 
So next, what we want to do is define what we think our expected living expenses are. And first off, before we even get into this, um, there's a few different categories that I identify that are really important to um, to have in our life. The first are fixed expenses. Those are expenses that are going to be the exact same um, so long as we're in our current situation. So for instance, like a mortgage or rent payment. Um, you know, again, if you're renting, which is totally fine, you can make this rent, you can make this house, whatever you want it to be. The most important part is just, you know, this number over here. But you put what that's going to be. And relatively speaking, that's going to be fixed. That's going to be an expense that, you know, to get out of it is going to be either you have to sell your house or, you know, basically declare bankruptcy. Because uh, if you stop paying your house, you're going to get foreclosed on, bad things are going to happen, but everybody needs a place to live. So um, that's kind of the biggest place to start, to start up on these fixed expenses. If you have power associated with it, I call it a fixed expense. You can't just stop paying power. Um, there's things you can do, solar panels, you know, whatever other sources of power that you have. But relatively speaking, all of these are fixed expenses here. Um, so I label those as those aren't going to change. Those are going to be there. Something you have to absorb as a as a person, um, you know, living in the 21st century. On the next category, necessity expenses. Now, the difference between necessity and fixed is that these necessity expenses aren't necessarily fixed like a mortgage is. Like typically a mortgage, I mean, it'll just depending on how they change you know escrow based on you know PMI and various things like that but basically necessity expenses are expenses that you need in your life but they aren't necessarily fixed for instance groceries you know you could one month spend 250 and then really become a coupon cutter or cut down or maybe even scale it up and spend more but you this is adjustable I mean we could go 120 a month if we want we could go 400 a month if we want but basically the ideal is to figure out that this is you have to eat I mean you can't eat um, or you can't not eat and survive. So you have to figure out what is this exact expense going to be in your life. And, uh, you know, again, for right now we're just predicting out. I've kind of known for myself it's right around 250. Um, that's kind of my average. And again, I have data that I look at that shows that. But I think that's a good round number for a lot of people. Um, it might change, you know, per your situation. Uh, for myself, it's gas to get to job, you know, car insurance to have that. You know, and, and one thing that I recommend, and this, you know, a lot of people might be um, in a different boat, and again, you can adjust this however you want, but I'd recommend making savings as a necessity expense. Don't think of it as something that if I have the money, I'll do it. Um, maybe someday I'll do it. Make it a necessity expense. Make it something that it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a thousand. I mean, that's a pretty big uh, number for a lot of people, but let's say it ends up being 200 a month. I mean, that's something that you're committed to doing, committed to start building up your uh, emergency fund month after month after month. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing for a lot of people to have is to make sure that you are putting that money away and not looking at it as a discretionary, which we'll get to in a second, but something that you have to do that um, you're going to do uh, month by month. And the last category is discretionary expenses. And those are things, I mean, I have a cleaning fee on here. I used to have a house cleaner. Don't, don't hate me. Um, yeah, she was really good at what she did, but I found that outsourcing, that function uh, really helped me and helped me, you know, build more businesses, more time for reading, go back to school to get my MBA. So it's something important. But obviously, I don't need to have that in my life. I don't need to have my gym membership. Um, supplies, I think a lot of times are discretionary. Um, and when I look at the supplies, it's like extra things I need, like maybe coffee cups. Do I really need another coffee cup? I don't think so. Um, you know, so I put those as, as uh, discretionary. Now, dining out, I mean, you might put maybe some part of it in necessity, but again, if you're uncertain and it's something that, hey, you could cut if worst came to worst, I'd put it in discretionary because that means that you know, everybody needs to eat, but if you're eating out at 50 bucks a night for two or, you know, 20 for one, I mean, that gets to be really expensive really fast. And that's something you could cut in favor of, you know, buying some groceries where, you know, you could have a, you know, 15 bucks last year a whole week. Um, so I think that that's really important. But, you know, as well, discretionary, I recommend having those in your life because, I mean, entertainment, like I, I live pretty cheaply entertainment wise. I play a lot of basketball. Um, I watch a lot of basketball. Uh, board games, yard games, stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money. So this isn't very big. I think it's important that if I want to go out to a movie or a game or something, like I make sure to allocate for that. Um, so I think it's important that we give ourselves that pleasure, not just say, you know, hey, this is going to be zero, because I just don't think that that makes a whole lot of sense in our lives. Um, 
So as with the other formula, what this does is the simple sum if formula of all of these categories right here. Um, and again, as you adjust them, we can see down here Excel. You know, if you don't know Excel, make sure you learn Excel and formulas. But if we change this, this number right down here begins to change. Um, if we put this back up at a thousand, this number, you know, my expense goes up by a thousand. Um, so it's really important, I think, to see that um, and to you know play with these numbers because you want to get to a point where. Um, you know what your total income is per year, your income per month, and you can kind of start to budget this out. What happens if, let's say I'm making $2,000 a month? What ends up happening is I'm going really negative here for income for the year, and I know that this is not going to be a good situation for me. I know this is not going to be a situation that's going to lead me to financial freedom. So one of two things needs to happen. I need to come up here and learn how to make more money, whether that's side income, whether that's making more money through a business or a salary, um, or I need to come down here and really cut these expenses. If I start to cut my monthly house to 500, I mean, that number is almost cut in half. So I think that that's really important to understand that, you know, in this model, you kind of can play with those numbers. And you can say, all right, if I'm committed to making 4,000 a month, cutting housing to 500, um, you know, maybe my savings rate to 500 for the time being, I'm going to have this, you know, $16,000 worth of money left over to do what it is that I need to do with it. So I think that that's uh, a great place to start for a lot of people to kind of start playing with these numbers. I'd recommend to estimate, but also get as close as you can to um, reality. Uh, you know, and as you get more data, as you do this, you're going to get closer and closer to reality all the time. So, how to predict the budget in a nutshell. Um, again, it's pretty easy. You can see the formulas. I'll put them out here for you. Revenue, simple sum if of these. This one is just this times 12. So this number times 12, which is projecting out for the year. This one is the same sum formula up to here. Um, the same, you know, uh, this number times 12, so projecting it out for the year. And then um, the total income per month is basically taking your total income up here, so B6, minus your total expenses down here, which is B29. Uh, you know, and the same thing with uh, this column right here is uh, B7 minus B33. So if you want to build this out yourself, go for it. I mean, I build in Google Docs, pretty easy to do, not that hard of a model, um, but it does help you estimate out and plan out your life expenses. Um, next, we're going to come over here to the income statement. This was something that I used to have a in Excel, a long conditional sum if, which I really liked. It worked pretty well, but it was an additional add-on tool that I had to add, and it got really complex, and it um, actually didn't work in Google Docs. I couldn't even get it to work in Excel sometimes. I'd have to rewrite the whole formula, which would take a long time, and then you have to figure out what, why it's broken. So what I basically did is I came over here, um, and I uh, created this sheet, which what it does, I mean, again, I, I try for simplicity. I try not to make my models um, overly complex. So what this formula does is it basically tracks your income per year. Now, one thing that's important, um, this predicted budget is an estimator. You estimate what your um, expenses are going to be. You estimate what your income is going to be. This is going to be where you actually see what your income is. So this is like, you know, rubber meets the road type stuff. So this income ledger right here, you can see this formula sums up everything in this column if it equals income over here. And we're not, I'm not going to break down, you know, how to figure out this formula if you want to figure that out. Um, you know, Google it or um, email me and maybe I'll help you out. Or like I said, if this is interesting, maybe I'll put it online for you. Um, but this one sums up the expenses all to arrive at the profit. And so your goal here is once you have a new income or expense is to enter it in here. So what I do, you know, I do it once a month for 30 days. I call it my budget day. Um, I kind of lay out the process uh, in an article. I'll put that in my notes. Um, but if I come out here and I'll say I have some income from my employer, i call that income, salary, and let's say it's for 2000 again. So as you can see, that made my total income go up to 6000 So now I have a, I'm running even a higher profit for the year. Um, and so what you do is you come in here, and like I said, I recommend once a once a week. I mean that's what I found a good cadence that works for me. But if there, you know, if you want to do it more often than that, like every day or every other day, feel free on um, whatever works for you. But basically, you're going to come in here and you're going to um, input these in here 
as uh, either pluses or minuses. We're doing minuses for the expenses. You can put some details in here. I mean, sometimes I come in here and do I mortgage if you want. If I spell it right, mortgage, more cable. I mean, you can put coffee with now. I mean, whatever you want to put for details just for yourself. Um, but basically, you know, you're going to put the month. Sometimes you can put the date in here if you want to put it on a new column. I actually just started doing that because I have some duplicate expenses sometimes that I don't know if I track for them. Um, so that would be a pretty relatively easy thing to do. Um, but the other thing, the other big thing in here, besides, you know, inputting the dollars right, you don't want to you know, put a negative for a positive, so just make sure you're doing that right, is to put the description. We'll see why that's important here in a second. Because um, the one drawback with this system, as opposed to the last system before that I had, um, this one, you need to do a pivot table in order to make the data make sense. I mean, there's other ways you could probably do it, but a pivot table is what I found out to be the easiest. So um, make sure your descriptions are relatively the same. Like, for instance, you see here I have two cable bills. I mean, if I come over here and this all of a sudden has an S on it, this wouldn't make sense because now they're two different categories. So you want to keep them all one category if possible, um, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so what I did is I came over here, and I just created a quick little pivot table off this. And this was something that you could do maybe on, a, I'd recommend maybe on a monthly basis or bi-monthly basis, but you basically come out here, and you can start to say, all right, how much did I spend um, for each month? You can see that, you know, I just basically copied and pasted most of these. But you can see that, you know, our mortgage is pretty well set. But it totals up everything based on those columns. So Caribou Coffees looks like I only had one each month, cable, one each month, grocery store. That kind of changed. So you can see that if we had, you know, added an S there in the previous column, so we added grocery stores, we'd have two different columns in here in the description type, which just wouldn't make sense. Um, so this is just something that <clears throat> if you do this example, you can easily throw together a quick pivot table. Um, again, they're pretty easy to do to kind of give you your running totals. Um, or there's other things you can do too. You could create a new table. I don't do that right now just because it's, you know, simplicity is my key on how I do this stuff. If it gets too complex and it gets challenging to do month after month. So um, that's kind of important. Again, tracking our expenses, displaying it so we can see and maybe you can see trends like, hey, you know, July I made this much, August I made this much. What happened? Well, we can see we didn't account for employer income yet. Well, did you get fired? Did you work on tips and now you're not making as much? So that's kind of something important to see right there. So now we go over to the balance sheet. I'm going to get a drink of coffee. So this, I think, is probably one of the most important documents that you can have in your personal financial situation. Um, the reason being is that um, this is your snapshot in time. The balance sheet tells you where you're at at any one point in time and can you or can you not afford a certain type of purchase. So, and I'll just go over it quickly what a balance sheet is. Um, it's basically a collection of assets, which are right here. This is all of your assets that are all totaled up right here. And it's going to take minus liabilities, which these are all your liabilities. Now, once you get that, you take your assets, which is over here, minus your liabilities to equal up your net worth. And what that is basically going to tell you is that um, right now I have 150K net worth, or at least this example, 150K, um, because I have more assets than liabilities. Now, you know, if we came over here and said that, let's say my mortgage was you know, 400000 that I had to pay off. I mean, all of a sudden, you're, you have a negative net worth. Now, your house value would go up, so I mean, it's maybe not the greatest example, or it theoretically should go up. If you're paying 400 k for 150 house, it's not the greatest financial move. Um, but you, you get the point. You can go in negative net worth territory, um, which is something to kind of be, uh, kind of watch out for. But for right now, we'll just go back to our original example. But basically, there's, uh, you know, out of those three main sections, there's kind of some caveats. Current assets are anything that um, we have, and the accounting definition is typically anything that's uh, due or payable within a year, and that's the current liabilities. But current assets is anything that is uh, liquid. Like if you needed to, you could liquidate it, cash it out, um, and use it to pay down debt right away pretty much. So if we look at this, anything that, we can have easy access to we want to call a current asset. So, you know, cash, obviously cash is current. We could take it, pay something down right away. Checking account, you know, money market account up to a uh, caveat of six times of withdrawals per month. So, I mean, I still consider that current so long as you're 
um, planning that out. Definitely our cash back bonuses, brokerage account that's in a taxable account. So that'd be like our first trades of the world. That'd be, you know, whoever else we're using. And I also do AR here. So this is um, money that is owed to me by people but not yet collected. And I anticipate this out for the next 30 days. So if we go next 30 days, I'm going to make, you know, $2,000. Ideally, in our previous example, if we're estimating a salary of $4,000 a month, that would be $4,000 because it's two paychecks. We usually get paid two times a week. So we're anticipating everything out we're going to see in the next 30 days. So the biggest thing to remember here is anything that we could convert to cash right away, that's what we want to have in this column. Okay, Long-term assets, exactly what it sounds like. Anything that's really not easily converted to cash but could be. I mean, my car, for instance, you know, Toyota RAV4 is worth $15,000. It's probably less now, but I'm using this as an example. Um, if I went to sell this, I could sell it, but it'd probably take a little while to unload it in the market. It wouldn't just be I put it out there and I get it sold right away. Um, it would be something that it would take a little while, take a long time. So that's why I recognize it not as a current asset because I couldn't go out there and somebody give me cash in a day. It'd be, you know, I'd have to probably do a process. It might take a couple weeks, a month, um, or I could take a, you know, bath on it and it, you know, sell it for 7000 quicker, but then I wouldn't get the full value. Um, so that's why we classify those as long-term, as they're not as easily convertible into cash. Same thing, you know, I always classify um, traditional and Roth IRAs, uh, 401ks, whatever that happens to be, as long-term assets as well, because while it is cash, or at least stock, which can be easily converted into cash, you cannot do uh, the, those conversions without a penalty at this current point in time. So I always classify those as long-term. I don't have any plans of touching them. Um, and if you're in an IRA, I mean, ideally, you shouldn't either. Um, so, but that's just, and then if we um, do all the totals, basically, again, this sheet is pretty easy. These are all sum formulas, and this is the sum of all of our asset columns. So, again, it's pretty easy to um, input all of this information uh, and get a picture of our total assets. And just in your mind when you're going through all this, you just want to brainstorm everything you have out there. Hey, what do I, what am I, what's in my wallet? Um, what's in my checking account? Do I have a savings account or a money market? What's in there? Um, the other thing, I, I didn't mention this, but cashback bonus, I consider those current assets because you can use the this amount directly applied if you use credit cards to uh, trim down the balance of those credit cards. So I think it's important to recognize that as a current asset because essentially you're going to be paying less on um, what you have owed on credit cards. So that's your current asset, or that's your asset section. So if we come down here to current liabilities, it's pretty much the same. I mean, current liabilities, anything due, I, I do in the next 30 days. Sometimes I might push that out to 60 days, but essentially anything due in the next 30 days, I'm going to put as a current liability. Um, and kind of how I operate, and you can come to my site to read my thoughts on credit cards, but I put everything that I can on a credit card because I get A bonuses, which is this cashback bonus stuff up here but then also it's just a nice easy place where I only have to pay this credit card as opposed to maybe like 50 different entities directly out of a checking account and then reconcile that I just have everything in one place on these credit cards so long as I'm never paying interest on this it makes sense if I have to get to a point where I can't pay these credit cards off <clears throat> and I pay that 18 20 25 percent interest that's where that becomes a disaster for me and I can't do that and you shouldn't either if you're in that situation. Um, so that's just kind of something to think about. Um, but basically, yeah, anything, and I, again, I have anything due in the next 30 days um, as a current liability. Uh, and then we get that easy sum of formula. The biggest caveat that's a little different is I use this to track due dates for myself as well. So this cable, if this is due on, you know, let's say 6 20, 19, I go ahead and I make sure that I know that's the due date and if I haven't paid it I leave this column blank so whenever I come in here I look cable forty dollars due on 6 2019 have I paid it oh I haven't then I'll go in there to my you know I'll open up my new tab here and I'll go in there and I'll pay it um, and then I'll come over here and mark it paid PD you can do whatever terminology you want but I find that this really helps me because from here I mean I don't have the dates I you know again this is a template I use for my book um, but if I go to this credit card this hasn't been paid yet looks like this one has so now I'd want to go into my this credit card and look in there and be like okay what's the what's the statement amount that's due that's not gonna 
you know, once I pay it, I'm not going to incur any interest, and I want to make sure I get that paid right away. Um, mortgages, I always have those on auto pay from checking accounts. You can't pay those on credit cards typically. Um, so, yeah, so that's the kind of caveat. I have some notes just in, you can see here, cancel. Should I cancel my cable? I'd save 40 bucks a month. Um, I kind of put notes to myself sometimes. Uh, I think it's important just if you're questioning it, maybe you don't want to make the decision yet, you put a note here. I think it's pretty straightforward. And then here is long-term uh, liabilities, uh, you know, obviously mortgage, you know, I put in here, car insurance, I had umbrella ins insurance for a while, I think I, I still might have it, I'm not sure, I'd have to look. Um, but, you know, it's again, it's an easy sum, there's formula. The only other thing that I do here is I track how much I paid down, because it's just, it's interesting to me. Um, so I do my original mortgage amount, and then I do my current amount, and if I take this, minus this, it gets me the amount that I paid down of principal. Now this doesn't include interest, um, which is, you know, I have some articles on my site about I owned a home for 10 years, does it make sense? I mean, in some cases it does, but I hate interest payments now. Um, so, you know, I paid 21000 in this theoretical example, um, but realistically, I think this would probably be about 60, 70 K of interest that I would have paid on it. And you can, I give real life numbers in the uh, example, and I'll link it in the YouTube notes here for everybody um, so yeah so once you total up all these long term these current you come over here to your total liabilities you add up this plus this gets you your total liabilities and then again your net worth is just your assets minus your liabilities so in this case I'm running a positive net worth which is pretty awesome um, you know but again we don't want to get too committed to that because if I come over to IRA let's say the markets go down and all of a sudden this is at 50k well typically you always want to stay invested if you're a younger person my net worth just fell by 50k um, that's where I think it's important not to put all of your thought process onto this one single number but just kind of be conscious of it and if you see the general trend where it's kind of going up in a positive direction that's what you want to see the last thing I'd recommend on this balance sheet is <coughs> having some uh, ratios and this is just something that I always track just so I know my cash position cash plus current liabilities working capital um, this helps me know how liquid I am so for instance cash position that's just important to know how much cash I have on hand I include everything that is basically as good as cash anything I can liquidate right now into cold hard cash um, and pay stuff off so that's going to be everything here this AR I can't do that um, for instance work you know four thousand dollars if I get paid in 15 days I mean that's pretty good but it's not cash I can't go in and tap that uh, you know unless I have an advanced program but even then you know ideally I don't want to do that so I just go conservative I don't recognize this as cash so I'm running that cash position this is might be the most important ratio here cash less current liabilities if I needed to pay all of these current liabilities today so the seven thousand three hundred twenty three dollars worth out of my current cash position would I be positive or negative and as long as this is positive, I know that I have the resources on hand to make payments for all my current liabilities. Um, let's assume, for instance, for a second, that this goes up to 5000 Now I'm coming down here. I have a negative cash position. It's not that big, but it's that thing where I might have trouble paying down some of those current liabilities. So this would not be a good situation. So I'd have to look at this to say, all right, how can I make more money? How can I convert more cash? Or probably the easiest way, how could I spend less? I mean, if I'm spending $10,000 here on my credit cards, that's a lot of money to be spending on credit cards. Um, and it's probably doing something wrong from that perspective. So uh, that would be something that I'd easily want to fix. Um, the last thing, uh, last couple of things, working capital. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's current assets minus current liabilities. Um, same thing, I mean, that's basically the same thing as a quick ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities and that just kind of helps you know tell you how liquid you are quick ratio is cash divided by current liabilities um, and you can see like debt net worth we've already talked about that um, so I think ratios kind of really helps take all of this data over here that you might be seeing and summarize it up really nice and easy for you um, and then the other thing I do obviously is I set goals I want to say you know 100k cash position or whatever whatever it is I mean you could change this to whatever your situation is 25,000 working capital I mean I kind of believe that old axiom if you uh, shoot for the stars you might hit the moon so for me I mean I put some pretty large numbers in here not 10,000 100,000 so I want to get that cash position to 100k if I miss it, maybe I end up getting 50, 60. I mean, that's still pretty dang good. Um, so definitely something to think about. Uh, but yeah, that's your balance sheet in a nutshell. Um, and the last thing that we're going to talk about here today is the checkbook register. Now, 
This has kind of gone by the wayside of importance since banks have become so keen on keeping um, money. I mean, basically, they're you know some of the they have some of the best technology in the world, so the chances of them screwing up is pretty slim, especially kind of with developments in blockchain. A lot of them are kind of toying with that. But I still keep this because I, at the end of the day, no matter if you use credit cards or if you use cash or if you use a debit card, everything needs to come out of a cash position. So I need to have cash to pay for things. So I start off with a $2,000 balance in here. I need to be able to anticipate payments that are coming out. If I come in here and let's say I have a 62719 credit card, I'm not going to fill out all the fields, payment coming out, and let's say it's for negative 2000 so I'm paying 2000 the credit card company, I'm going to run a negative balance of doing so. So I need to make sure that I have some extra cash in here before I make this payment on the 27th. Um, so the biggest thing that I use this for, you know, again, is somewhat of a balancing act, um, but it's more importantly to anticipate these items that I have uh, coming out in the future. So if I know that I have 2000 coming out, what I would do is I'd actually move this to the next line here, and I would do 6, uh, let's say on 625.19, I do money market. I would go ahead and I would transfer over let's say $2,000 in order to make sure that that is whole for me. So I want to make sure that I have enough money to cover this payment because I keep, one of the things that I do is build a savings and investing lab. I keep my checking account balances right around about $1,000. Um, and then everything else is in savings, stocks, it's earning money for me. So I'm making money while I sleep. That's really important. Um, so the biggest thing that I do is, you know, I transfer money back and forth between money market and credit card. And this helps me to anticipate that. Um, so kind of just one of my little things that I do here, I thought it would be over there, but whatever. So it's a little bit different color and here we'll do them all the same color. Um, oh, uh, not, not another color. So anything that's anticipated, I go ahead and I highlight it like this. So let's assume that the date today is, uh, 5-22-18. Um, so if we do that, I know that here's where I'm at. I've planned out these purchases um, that are coming up or these outflows and inflows. Um, so I know that if this is how it is and I transfer over $2,000 from my money market, I'm going to have enough money to cover this credit card payment and anything else uh, that's coming due. And that's really important for sanity of mind to avoid fees. Um, I once had a checking account fee, which actually kind of uh, of like I think 25 or 35 dollars that hit me because I had an overdraft and that one thing had me start up my budgeting process and I've never had an overdraft since um, so it's been really important for me to do this to kind of have my financial sanity about myself so I use this as a good anticipation tool um, so this is something that I recommend that you do too um, if you want to go out there google how to set up a checkbook register it's pretty easy um, or like I said if this is useful uh, leave a comment um, and I'll go ahead and look to get is put on the website um, but basically um, what you're going to do with this is you're going to start with you know whatever de your deposit credit balance is because when you set up a checking account they always ask you to deposit something so it's like two thousand and then you just build in this formula right here and again it might look complex and might look a little um, you know challenging but really it's not all it's saying is you know I think if this is blank and this is blank don't sum up anything so that's why these or if we drag this here this will be a formula, but it'll be, it'll be blank because both of these columns are blank. Um, but if it's not blank, like you know, and if it's if these aren't blank, this formula goes away, and then you basically take this plus this plus this to get this balance. So it's pretty. It seems like a complex formula. It's not really that complex. Um, you know, and I'll leave it up on the screen here for a second in case you want to write that down. And I'll uh, put it in the YouTube notes as well for you. Um, but it's just something that, again, I recommend that everybody does this to track, to plan out their purchases. Make sure you never have another overdraft fee. And if you can start putting together a budget like this in your own life, it's really going to lead to a lot of benefits down the road. Because, again, I don't think that I'd be at where I'm at right now financially without having a budgeting process in place. Um, I believe that, sincerely that that is the foundation for uh, anybody seeking financial freedom. So, um, so yeah, so that's my kind of summary about this. Again, I kind of wanted to go through this in addition to 
publishing the simple budgeting I wanted to make sure I put a video out there my goal is to provide a ton of free resources for people um, and if you have any more um, comments questions I mean feel free to email me or again this is all in simple budgeting it's in, available on Amazon um, for I think seven dollars right now um, so it's not gonna break the bank and again it's something that if you do it it's gonna put you on a path towards um, being financially free or being able to be financially free um, so yeah so go ahead um, check that out rewatch this video um, and just kind of let me know what you think and um, the other thing I'd say before leaving is that I do have an email list it's always growing people are really interested you know I find a lot in investing piece but I'm still gonna try to make it about um, you know money tips hacks tricks that I've kind of learned over the years to make more put my money to work so if you want to come over here to uh, you know money uh, this is under our dividend learning center live free and div hard come and sign up um, you know I promise to never spam you uh, all I want to do is send you some great uh, content uh, occasionally I try to email out um, you know once a week or every other week uh, with some good information for you um, so yeah come over here sign up follow us on these social media channels if you aren't already and um, until then good luck setting up that budget and uh, this is Ramey signing out take care